Welcome to Discovering the Law. My name is Lucy Rivera and I am the host of this program. Today we're going to learn about the correction system, civil rights, among other things, with our very, very special guest, Len Keston. Attorney Keston, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy to be here, Lucy. Please tell us a little bit about you so the public gets to know your journey to this. It's been a long journey. I was uh, born in Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, my parents, uh, I was born after the war, my parents are Holocaust survivors. Uh, when I was eight years old, we moved from Poland to Israel, lived there for two years. And then uh, when I was 10, we moved to uh, the United States, uh, lived in Brooklyn, New York for a year. My father worked in a fish store. And then my father bought a chicken farm. And I grew up on an egg farm in Connecticut. And from there, you now are an expert, among other things, uh, civil rights. But also, I, I want us to, you, to please share with us your knowledge as to the uh, corrections and uh, halfway house system. You were a superintendent of a halfway house. What is a halfway house, and what kinds are there? Well, the the there are basically two two part two kinds of halfway houses for people coming out of prison. Yes. Uh, I worked both in Connecticut and in Massachusetts mm -hmm. in something known as a pre-release center. Pre -release. The correction system, when you're convicted of a crime and you're sent to prison, mm -hmm. uh, there are all kinds of prisons. There are maximum security, medium security, but the concept is that you will transition into the community. In a pre-release center. Into a pre-release center. You, you do not want to uh, lock somebody up for three or four years and then throw them out the door when they have nothing. Exactly. So I, my interest was always in working to help uh, I work with men, but there's, there's homes for women as well, help these fellows uh, get jobs. So when they moved into the pre-release center, uh, they would come in typically in the last year of their sentence. You're still serving your sentence. And the one I worked in in Massachusetts was right in the back bay in the Fenway area. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would uh, get you, try to find you a job, mm -hmm. set you up with support systems if you needed a drug program, alcohol program, and you'd get furloughs to spend time with your friends and family. And you were, it was an honor system. So if you could handle that, then at the end of that, you were released, typically to parole, a supervised release, but you were released and you could go home. On the other hand, if you had, had a major violation of the rules, you could end up right back in Walpole. So you could be in downtown Boston one, one minute and back in Walpole Prison and an hour later if you didn't obey the rules. And what is the difference between the pre-release center and the halfway house? Uh, another type of program is, is once you finish your sentence, mm -hmm. you can go into what's known as a halfway house, uh, similar concept, except it's post-sentence. So in, in those circumstances, there's all kinds. There's some privately run, some run by the state, but in those circumstances, uh, similar program, but uh, it takes more to get you back to prison. But it, these are all designed to help folks transition out of prisons. There's also programs that help them. There's a lot of support built up. It's always a struggle to get the money for it, to help people coming out of prison. Because how else are you going to uh, change your life? Now, are these, are these services effective? In, and what is their objective? The objective is to uh, get people reacclimated to society and hopefully get them in a situation where they don't fall back into the old habits. If you have a drug, if you have a drug program, hopefully help you with that. If you have uh, an alcohol program, help you with that. Help you get a job. Help you find a career. One of my, oh, I, I started out as a counselor working in Connecticut with prisoners. There was a guy who was an armed robber, career mm -hmm. armed robber, mm -hmm. who learned how to make false teeth. He oh. became an artist, and it was a new career, and he made good money, and he stayed out of prison. It was a wonderful thing to see that this guy now had a skill other than sticking people up. And do you, do you see that there are many programs like this? Who qualifies for them uh, in order? Does, does everyone get to go to a halfway house or a pre-release facility? Well, it all depends on the administration of the public mood mm -hmm. because, you know, as, you, as you may know, the public always uh, likes to say, we just lock them up, let's not do this. Mm -hmm. But uh, it depends on the budget, depends on the times. There's never enough money for it. Plus, you have to behave. I mean, that we're not gonna, you're going to be transitioned out of a locked, locked prison into a halfway house unless you behave yourself in a locked prison. Mm -hmm. So it's not available to people that never behave themselves. You have to prove that you can handle the responsibility because that you're not going to run away or get in a halfway house and kill someone or do something terrible. And do you have a sense of their success rate? 
So I've said this, the success rate is much higher than, than letting people, just letting people out of prison. Mm -hmm. You know, the success is hard to measure because after all, no matter what's done in the prisons or anywhere else, you, you then go back to your old environment and hopefully you have the strength to stay out of trouble. Um, who are the people who go to the pre-release and to the halfway house programs? These are all, I mean, as I say, the programs are set up for people, for women, mm -hmm. uh, coming out of our women's prison in Framingham. Mm -hmm. and and for men, so it's all kinds. I mean, mm -hmm. the people I used to, there's a basketball court in the Fenway. Yes. Uh, the the pre-release center that I ran was directly across the street. And okay. so there were pick up basketball games. And I always tell some of the people that didn't know who they were playing with, be careful who you argue with, because some of these people have actually killed people. <laughs> it, it, the level of crime doesn't matter. You mm -hmm. could have been in for murder, you could mm -hmm. have been in for armed robbery, you could have been in for burglary. It didn't matter mm -hmm. the level of crime. If you behaved yourself in the prison mm -hmm. and you were within a year of getting out, mm -hmm. you would qualify to go into one of these facilities. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't mm -hmm. that you just went in there if you committed little crimes. It could be big crimes. So we had all kinds of people. Mm -hmm. That is, is extremely interesting and hopeful to know that this exists in society. Tell us about, uh, you were an administrator for the Department of Corrections. Yeah. Tell us about your experience there. Well, uh, all these jobs, the Prelease Center was Department of Corrections, but I also, I worked in, in Walpole Prison, mm -hmm. uh, which is the maximum security prison in Massachusetts. So when people say, what, what do you do for a living? I say, I spend every day with 660 of the most dangerous men in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. And uh, the prison, um, at the time, there were a number of murders that happened inside the prison. Uh, it's a tough place. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I realized at working in prisons is I would never want to do time. Anybody that thinks uh, people believe that people in prison have it easy, they don't. Uh, mm -hmm. Walpole's a tough place. Everybody there has either done something really bad, but you stay in Walpole. The prison system is graduated. That is, when you're sentenced to prison, what the prison administrators look at is how dangerous are you going to be inside. So it doesn't matter what you did. Are you going to be, you could be a, a small time criminal, but if you're going to be violent inside, you stay in a maximum security prison. Once you demonstrate that, you're, that you can get along with others, you go to medium and then minimum and eventually pre-release. That's the concept. But some people never leave maximum security because mm -hmm. they come in and then they kill people. I mean, we, have, we had at the time in the 70s, there were a lot of murders inside the prison. Mm -hmm. And you know what happens to them if you kill somebody inside the prison? Mm -hmm. You stay in the prison. <laughs> Not much. So wh which ones are the maximum security uh, right now, Massachusetts, Walpole, which is now called Cedar Junction, mm -hmm. and there's another one in Shirley. Uh, so there's two maximum security facilities in Massachusetts right now. Okay, and then... Back when I was working, it was only one. And so uh, tell us about the graduation. Uh, when do you go to maximum? You, 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 you go in, when you're sentenced in, you are what's known as classified. You are evaluated to see what level of security you need inside. At the Department of Corrections? The Department of Corrections. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they graduate. I was, my job when I was working at Walpole was placement within the prison because there's different levels of security inside the prison. Yes. The whole prison maximum security meeting, nobody escapes. Mm -hmm. There has been one, Walpole was built in 1952. Mm -hmm. There's been one successful escape out of that prison in all those years. Fascinating. And he snuck out by hiding inside a car. Nobody's ever gone over the wall. It's never happened. In, and that's a maximum security maximum prison? Maximum security. So uh, mm -hmm. my job was to put people within Walpole in different units. If you misbehave in Walpole, you're put in isolation, which is awful. 23 and a half hours in a cell, locked up. Because when you go into a prison, if you have, have you ever been? Do, um, I have seen people, but I have never been in prison myself. But have you been in a, in a prison? <laughs> I've, visit, I've seen some people, yeah. not, not related, but clients. So. Yeah. yeah, but when you go in, you know, go in, I remember my first time, you assume that everybody's locked up in a cell, but they're not. When you go inside, there are people are wandering around the hallway because they're going, we have school in prison. Yeah. There's all sorts of groups in prison. There's people have jobs. So when the first time you, I walked into Walpole, it's like, who are all those people? They're the inmates. Mm -hmm. And they're walking around and they're, they're uh, working. There's jobs inside the prison. It's, it's a, an interesting society. It is. I, enjoy, I truly enjoyed working with those folks. Nice, maintain contact with a lot of them. They used to call me Warden Lenny. <laughs> Warden Lenny. Yeah. Um, Warden Lenny, what do you, what's your comment on the, uh, uh, co the correction system? What is your... Um, the correction system, you know, your, it's, uh, it's, uh, historically it's not particularly effective, realistically, but nobody's found a good alternative. That's the problem. You know, it's, I mean, locking people up is not the best way to deal with it, but society's been searching for alternative whatever. In some places they cut off your arm. 
It's a yeah. tough system. You don't want to be in it. Stay out of it. <laughs> stay out the of best it. thing, I, best advice given is stay out of it. It is no fun. Um, attorney Kasten, yes. you have done a lot of litigation, civil rights, in addition, and you have. A, if, if you look at your, if you Google your name, there's a lot of really interesting material that you work with, especially in the school system, um, school liability. Would that? Would you like to expand a little bit on, on cases about school liability and in what circumstances can a lawsuit be successful against a school? I mean, obviously, uh, this, this, the schools is where we train our young, where our young spend a lot of time, and I, I was a teacher at one point. <laughs> I've had many careers, but uh, yes. uh, there's a lot of litigation around the schools. Um, the, uh, the, the, the problem is, is, I don't know if it's a problem, the issue is that uh, people rightfully, as parents, I'm a parent, get upset if something happens to a kid in the school. Yes. The other side of it is, how is the school going to prevent it and when you're going to open the school to lawsuits. Yes. Because when you put a lot of people together, mm -hmm. especially when they're young and their hormones are flowing, mm -hmm. all sorts of things happen. Yes. Uh, we know this. We all went to school. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, and so uh, the law has made it so it's difficult to successfully sue a school because they don't want to see suits all the time. Because parents, we're all very protective about our children. So parents get upset. My son got beat up in the school. Why didn't you stop it? Mm -hmm. Well, the problem is, how can you? It's not a prison. Even in a prison, people get beat up. Much less a school, how do you watch them all the time? So we see a lot of litigation involving uh, fighting in schools. There's a lot of litigation involving uh, various uh, full-blown sexual contact or sexual harassment uh, in school. We have bullying. Bullying has been a huge issue now in litigation. It's, 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 it's a major issue for all of us. And there's issue about relationship with uh, teachers and students. So there's a lot of this, and drugs, of course, and drug and drugs. alcohol abuse in the schools. And what is the standard, or what are the effective ways to, to win a lawsuit? What, what are the requirements that would prevent it or make it win? The, the, the issue with schools is, in anywhere else, so let's say I'm going to your house yes. and you have a loose step and I trip and fall. Mm -hmm. If I can prove that you should have known that the step was loose, I don't have to prove you actually knew it, but mm -hmm. you should have known it if you were careful. Mm -hmm and you could have done something more, even though what you did, you tried to fix it, but it wasn't good enough, I can win that lawsuit. It's mm -hmm. a lower standard. Yes. In order to win a lawsuit against a school mm -hmm. for failing to prevent uh, 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 your child from being sexually harassed, mm -hmm. you, have to show, you have to show that the administrator actually, actually knew it was happening okay. and ignored it altogether. It's called mm -hmm. deliberate indifference. They completely mm -hmm. ignored it. Because again, we don't want to, the society has made a decision, we don't want to let the schools be sued for everything that happens. Mm -hmm. We've all gotten away with stuff yes. in school. I'm sure we have, there was against rules because we were able to get around it when mm -hmm. parents sometimes want to blame the school for that. There's only so much the school can do. That's right. Um, it's very interesting, lots of material. What about the um, student-teacher relationship? What are the legal issues in that? That, is, uh, that has become much more difficult to deal with for the schools uh, and, the, and, the, and the people because of the way our communications have changed. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm old. I'm, I get to now say back in my day. But you know, back in the day, before cell phones, before email, mm -hmm. um, it was easy. Mm -hmm. You didn't call your teacher at home. You had no contact with your teacher except at school. Yes. Now, we have Facebook, we have social media, we have cell phones. Right. So there could be 24-7 contact. So everybody's struggling, what should the rules be? Mm -hmm. Should the teachers not give out cell phones? Mm -hmm. Well, that's not going to work because of, uh, you just do. That's what people use. Can students and teachers text? Each so other. Text each other. Uh, they know where they live. They learn, I mean, with Facebook, you know, and other social media outlets, you know a lot more about each other. So the lines get blurry and dealing with that issue and allows for all sorts of much more contact between the two and yep. it's fraught with danger, you know, in terms of uh, inappropriate relationships. Mm -hmm. So the schools struggle with it and we see a fair amount of litigation now over it is uh, mm -hmm. teachers and students, you know, having all sorts of inappropriate contact mm -hmm. and then something bad happens and they, they blame the teacher. And it's a difficult issue to do with how to set the rules has become a struggle for all of us, the lawyers, the judges, and school administrators. Um, what about litigation in terms of bullying? Tell us about what you've seen, the cases, and... Well, you know, there's been, I mean, I have, there's been an explosion in mm -hmm. the term mm -hmm. bullying. Mm -hmm. yeah, it used to be being mean. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's serious bullying, and there's the he called me a name or gave me the finger bullying. <laughs> okay. And, 
A problem in dealing with that as a lawyer or a school minister again is, okay, so somebody comes to you and says, I'm a victim, and you want to protect the victim. Eight times out of ten, the other student will tell you, I'm the victim. Mm -hmm. So who's the victim? The one that first came to you? Or the, or the other one? And mm -hmm. yes. how do you prove it? I mean, okay. sometimes kid, you know, people get mad at each other. Yes. You know, I, you may get mad at me and say, I'm not going to talk to him anymore. <laughs> well, then I feel bad. I would feel very bad if you wouldn't want to talk to me, Lucy. <gasps> Thank you. And I would feel bad. <laughs> and then I would say, well, now she's being mean and she's bullying me. Mm -hmm. You know, she and right. her friends don't talk to me. Mm -hmm. We have that situation come up a lot. You know, now this, you're in with a group of people and then suddenly they don't want to deal with you anymore and now you feel terrible and the parents say, these people are mistreating my son, so can you order? I had a situation where the, uh, the young man in a high school, it was litigation over the fact that he, they didn't want to sit with him in the cafeteria. <laughs> And, and, and we, the, the principal and me, I had to get involved, like, where is everybody going to sit during lunch? That became a court case. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a really difficult problem to struggle with because it, it is a real issue, and we're much more sensitive when we're younger. Hopefully we grow out of it, <laughs> although some of us still get upset if people <laughs> don't like us. Hopefully we grow out of it, but people in adolescence are much more sensitive. So uh, you get these claims, you know, you have... And you have litigation, and the issue often is, is what would you like the court to do? You know, we can't make people like you mm -hmm. or want to <laughs> talk to you. And, okay, if they give you the finger, yes, it's, <laughs> you deal with it because it's supposedly bullying. I mean, I had a case, a litigation over the fact that uh, somebody posted on their Facebook page giving them the finger. <laughs> I did feel like, you have to be kidding, right? Yeah. You want me to go to court <laughs> over this? <laughs> but... People are sensitive. It's devastating to, to young people. It can be. It's a serious problem, but the legal system is ill-equipped to handle it. Ill-equipped. Um, what about schools? When uh, police officers, for instance, when is it appropriate for the police to intervene? Schools normally are the ones that are disciplined. And uh, what if you're mistreated by an officer? We can talk about uh, We'll talk about police officers, but the, yeah. the, the law enforcement in schools, mm -hmm. you know, a, lot, a lot of towns now have school resource officers. Mm -hmm. They have officers on site, and they have sort of a mixed job mm -hmm. because part of their job is, of course, law enforcement. On the other hand, you know, uh, if somebody's doing something, drinking or, you know, smoke, smoking dope in the school, you want to help them too. You don't just want to arrest them. <laughs> so this puts these school officers in an interesting position. Because mm -hmm. they don't want to start busting all these kids. They're there to help them. On the other hand, they can ignore it. But, uh, you know, we have a lot of serious issues. Violence in schools mm -hmm. and deadly violence in schools is, is certainly an issue. It happens. And law enforcement has to be vigilant. But on the other hand, it is a school. Yes. And it's a shame now the kids have to go through metal detectors in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. I think it's really sad that we're at that stage, but it's a necessity. Violence. Because you certainly have serious violence in there. And the police have to be aware of it. Drug abuse. Mm -hmm. So there's always the tension of when do you deal with it through the administrative process, mm -hmm. when do you deal with it the police process. Right. You know, the sale, of drugs in the, uh, the sale of drugs around the school, at some point law enforcement intervenes. And it's now, why do you want to help the kids involved? You can't ignore it, and there's, and there's consequences, serious consequences. I mean, the surest way to get yourself expelled is drugs in the school, Very in the good. school grounds. Yes, and violence. Of course. Mm -hmm. It goes without saying. So... Outside from the school realm, uh, if you are um, outside in the street and you are encountering a police officer, what's your advice when you encounter a police officer? <laughs> and uh, what's your advice when you feel like a police officer mistreated you? What are the steps? Well, first, you know, I've spent, uh, uh, I mean, I grew up in the 60s. I had long hair and I used to, I used to protest all the time. <laughs> I still protest. I still protest. <laughs> But it's funny now that I spent a lot of my life uh, working with law enforcement officers, and you know they're people too. So one of the things when you encounter uh, police officers, recognize it's a high-stress job. Mm -hmm. They never know when they're going to come home alive. Mm -hmm. You know, when they go out on the job. When I go on my job, odds are nothing's going to happen to me violent. <laughs> I might get yelled at, but nothing violent. But uh, when they go out, so it's stressful. Mm -hmm. So they're under a lot of stress, and sometimes they re can react badly. But the system works. Mm -hmm. You know, I see a lot of litigation against police officers, and I do a fair amount of training mm -hmm. on police officers. And while they have the power, I mean, they carry handcuffs, and they have the power to arrest you. We don't have the power to arrest them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> However, everybody's equal in court. Mm -hmm. And so the system, I think, is wonderful because if a police officer misbehaves badly and that person sues them, all of a sudden they're in court and they're facing a jury of civilians right. who judge them. Right. And it 
alters your behavior when you know there's consequences. Yes. And I get asked, can you arrest them? You can arrest them, but you'll pay a lot of money when you're sued because the mm -hmm. arrest is improper. And um, so do you believe in the system as it is in place now? The, the Very system? much. Yeah. You know, I, I, I do a lot. I've done a lot of trials. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of trial work in front of juries, and a lot of people are very cynical about our system. Mm -hmm. uh, but for my money, it's, it's absolutely the best system there is because we have their citizens. They're people like us, people like you, people like anyone here, people on the street. They get to, in the jury box, mm -hmm. and they... they the case is presented to them. They don't have any bias. We make sure they don't have any bias. And they make a decision. And whenever there's a group decision, that's why I like juries, a group decision tends to be the right one. Because you put together a group of 12 people, you may have two people on one side, two people that are nuts one way, two people that are nuts the other way, but they have to vote together. Mm -hmm. They tend to get <coughs> it right. I mean, I've tried, I don't know, probably 150 or more jury trials, mm -hmm. and 90% of the time, the jury's verdict makes sense, and I've lost my share of cases. But there, there's been plenty of cases I've lost. I've said, you know, I can understand why they did that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think they got they, they got it right. Occasionally, there's I call it the huh verdict. You know, mm -hmm. and I had them both ways. I have won <laughs> cases I didn't think I should win. I've lost cases I didn't think I should lose. It does mm -hmm. happen, but the system really does work. And almost everybody involved, every jury you talk to, will tell you they enjoyed it. They took it seriously and they enjoyed it, and they had a positive experience. Once you're a juror, yes. you almost always come away with it and say, you know, this is a great system. Mm -hmm. It works. I think so. It's important for everyone to fulfill their civic duty. Um, and in your opinion, as an attorney, what makes a good attorney? <laughs> what makes a good attorney? Well, first of all, uh, anybody that's interested in being a lawyer, uh, there's all kinds of things you can do as a lawyer. You know, I am, I am a trial person. I do the courtroom stuff. That's what I do. Uh, a lot of lawyers, you know, most lawyers don't do that. So first of all, to be a good attorney, it depends what you want to do. Uh, and I don't know how to be a good tax attorney or how to be good. <laughs> I don't do that. But if you, uh, to do the kind of stuff that I do, which is a lot of, you know, litigation, a lot of civil rights type work, real life disputes, uh, what makes a good attorney is the ability to listen, the ability to understand what the dispute is and the ability to em empathize with the other side. The biggest fault lawyers have is, my client must be right because they're my client. <laughs> so two sides of dispute. One person hires you, and then you say, okay, well this person is obviously right because you're telling me to a story and you're a nice person, it must be true. There's always two sides, and you have to be able to understand the other side to effectively present your side. Mm -hmm. But lawyers get, we call it locked in, I, they, we call it falling in love with your case, where you only believe in your case and your client, you don't understand what the other side is going to do. Mm -hmm. So our job is to, you know, you have, you have to be able to understand the other side, your side, to listen, and to be able to figure out what the important issues are. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have to present it. So there has to be, you know, I, I one of my early mentors was a lawyer named Thomas Burns, who'd been doing it for a long time, I also used to act. And oh. I came to the law later in life, so I was more of a formed human being. And uh, I watched him, and I realized, first of all, I didn't have to change. I like to tell jokes. I tell jokes in court. But you have to be able to present the case. It's like teaching. You can understand your case all you want, but you have to be able to present it to jurors, to other people, in a way that they can understand it. Mm -hmm. And that's the skill you need. And um, I wanted to ask you more questions, such as what makes a good judge? If you can quickly tell us, because we have to wrap up the program. But <laughs> what makes a good judge? Well, of course, every judge who's watching is a terrific judge. We <laughs> love the judges. What makes a good judge is, likewise, it's the ability to treat everybody with respect, mm -hmm. to listen, to be able to understand the issues and make fair decisions. Because judges are referees. They're not, advoca they're not advocates, but they have to be able to listen. It's a very difficult job. They have to listen to case after case. And I liken it to being a parent. The children are in front of them arguing, and the children <laughs> want them to decide which child is right. We're lawyers like children. We're right, they're right. And they have to, they basically just want us to get along. But they have to be able to listen and, and have respect for everybody, because for everybody it's their day in court. And I know you've had, I watched your show, you've had Judge Paul Chernoff, who's one of the finest examples of what a judge should be. <laughs> judge Troy is terrific. Judge Gans, I watched him. You need, but that's where you need to, they, they need to be able, they need to be interested. 
And that to me is the most valuable mm. skill in life, frankly. As long as you're interested in something, you're a much more interesting person. <laughs> Thank you, Attorney Kasten. It was really delightful to talk to you today, and I would love it if you would come again and just talk to us about all the our wonderful lectures you've given around the country as to all the knowledge you do and all the cases you've handled. Uh, but for us, the time is up, and I just wanted to thank everybody for uh, giving us your time and discovering the law. This episode can be watched at www.discoveringthelaw.com. And my name is Lucy Rivera, and I'm your, your host for today. Thank you for watching.